new cabinet lineup to be announced tomorrow. Vaccination rates must go up before considering booster shots. Hello and good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mohammed Amin Carlos. This is News at 10. Well, young Dibutuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah reiterated in Al Mustafa Bilashah today consented to the presentation of the list of new cabinet lineup by Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob. The list was presented during the Prime Minister's audience with the King at Istana Abdul Aziz in Kuantan Pahang earlier today. The Premier is expected to present his cabinet lineup tomorrow morning, and the swearing in ceremony will take place on Monday. Istana Nagara, in a social media post, said the audience, which began at 11 a.m., lasted an hour and a half. It was the second audience granted to Dato Sri Ismail Sabri as Malaysia's ninth Prime Minister. The first one took place after the presentation of his appointment letter and swearing in ceremony on 21st August. Well, after the audience, Al Sultan Abdullah and Raja Permaisuri Agong, Tunku Haja Aziza Amina Maimuna Skandaria, also hosted a luncheon for the Prime Minister. The vehicle carrying the Prime Minister was then seen leaving Isana Abdul Aziz at 1.38 p.m., more than two hours after it arrived. Although he did not stop to speak to the reporters waiting outside the palace, the Premier waved to them through an open rear window as his black car passed by. Accom accompanying him was uh, Pahang Menteri Basar, Dato Sri Wan Rosdi Wan Ismail. Well, the country's vaccination rate must be increased before a booster dose can be considered. Now, Health Director General Tansri Dr. Noor Hesham Abdullah said this is because the administration of a booster shot to those who have been vaccinated would not help to curb the spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19. Well, in a Facebook post, he said the important factor that can help to control the spread of Delta variant is to inoculate those who have not been vaccinated against the virus. It was previously reported that the Slango government is making preparations to provide the booster dose of COVID-19 vaccine under its Slango vaccine program known as Selvax. Its State Public Health, Unity, Women and Family Development Committee Chairman Dr. Siti Maria Mahmud said preparations include providing the vaccine for those age 18 and below, which is subject to approval by the Vaccine Supply Access Guarantee Special Committee, JKJAV. Meanwhile, Tansri Dr. Noor Hisham said a total of 180,000 doses of CanSino's single-dose COVID-19 vaccine has been sent to Sabah. The health DG is optimistic that the CanSino vaccine can help expedite and ramp up the vaccination rate, especially in the rural areas and among the identified targeted group in Sabah. Earlier this week, Sabah Health Director Dr. Rose Nani Mudin was reported as saying that Sabah received the first batch of 53,000 doses of the CanSino vaccine last Tuesday and the subsequent batches were expected to arrive later this month. All civil servants that have yet to register for COVID-19 vaccine are urged to immediately do so through my Sajatra application. Well, Public Service Department Director General Tansri Mohamed Kairul Adib Abdul Rahman said this measure is to help the government achieve herd immunity through national COVID-19 immunization program, thus curbing the spread of the pandemic. Oleh yang demikian, saya menyarankan agar semua penjawat awam untuk segera berdaftar dan tidak melengah-lengahkan lagi pendaftaran tersebut bagi melindungi diri sendiri dari kesan yang lebih memudaratkan. Malah kita semua bertanggungjawab untuk memberi penerangan yang betul terhadap kepentingan mendapatkan vaksinasi COVID-19 bagi mewujudkan imuniti kelompok sekurang-kurangnya kepada keluarga terdekat dan masyarakat sekeliling. On another note, Chancery Mohamed Kairul Adib also launched the Value Practice Management System or SPAN Dua Perpulan Kosong, an upgrade from SPAN created in 2007. Under SPAN Dua Perpulan Kosong, all ministries, departments and government agencies are set to conduct the value practice management holistically in order to enhance the value practice and integrity of individuals and organizations. 
The Perak State government is planning to set up 12 more new vaccination centers or PPVs and upgrade three existing PPVs in order to expedite the immunization process in the state. Its Menteri Basan, Dato Sarani Mohamad, said the matter is currently still under evaluation stage. Rekod menunjukkan pencapaian tertinggi pemberian vaksin di negeri Perak adalah sebanyak 39,998 pada 25 Ogos 2021. Bagi membantu mempercepatkan program imunisasi COVID-19 kebangsaan di negeri Perak, kerajaan negeri sedang membuat penilaian terhadap cadangan mewujudkan 12 lagi PPV baru dan menaik taraf 3 PPV sedia ada. Pera currently has 226 facilities that can implement the vaccination campaign with a capacity of administering between 40,000 and 45,000 doses per day. Dato Sarani said the state is expected to achieve 80% herd immunity by October and complete the entire vaccination program in November subject to vaccine supply. As of Tuesday, about 1.8%. 11 million people or 60.04% had received the first dose while 797,317 people or 42.81% had completed the second dose. Kelantan has decided to open another COVID-19 quarantine and low-risk treatment center PKRC next week following the surge of COVID-19 infections in the state. Well, the new facility would involve the PKRC at University Science Malaysia Health Campus in Kubang, Kerian. Uh, PKRC uh, kampus kesihatan USM ini adalah uh, PKRC yang ke-17 di negeri Kelantan. Buat masa ini, kita mempunyai 16 buah PKRC. According to Kelantan PKRC Director Dr. Mohamad Zurairi Mohamad Zubair, 156 beds will be provided for Category 1 and 2 patients and another 50 beds will be for patients with more severe symptoms under Category 3 and 4. He added with the latest edition of PKRC, he hoped that it can help to cater to the increasing COVID-19 patients, including those in Category 4 and 5. Most patients under these categories were placed at Raja Prompuan Zainab 2 Hospital in Kota Baru. Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC, has launched the Global Technology Grant, or GTG, which provides up to 2 million ringgit funding for technology companies and technology accelerators to expand their global market presence. Now, the agency said the initiative was aimed at nurturing global champions, driving investments, and catalyzing a digital innovation ecosystem through the development of commercial-driven products or services. What MDEC said in a statement that GTG GTG is open to both local and foreign-owned tech companies that are incorporated in Malaysia. The grant offers two types of incentives, with Type 1 is directed at technology companies and Type 2 is for technology accelerators. For Type 1, the grant covers up to 50% of total projects cost or up to 2 million ringgit, whichever is lower for locally owned companies. While for foreign owned companies, the grant covers up to 30% of total project costs or up to 2 million ringgit. Meanwhile, under Type 2, the GTG is targeted at foreign technology companies to set up centers of excellence to conduct high value tech innovations and research and development activities. Type 2 covers up to 30% of the project costs or up to 2 million ringgit, whichever is lower. Submissions for the GTG are open from tomorrow to 15 September with evaluation and approval set to be completed by October. The project evacuation or rather the project execution phase will begin in November and December. Malayan banking Burhad Maybank posted a net profit of 1.96 billion ringgit for the second quarter and the 30th June 2021 more than double the 941.73 million ringgit recorded in the same period last year. In a statement today, Southeast Asia's fourth largest bank by assets said its earnings improved as loans continued to grow, net interest margin expanded from a more cost-effective funding mix, and impairments came in lower compared with a year earlier. Now, the group recorded a steady growth in net operating income to 6.17 billion ringgit for the quarter, up 9.3% year-on-year, while its net impairment losses fell to 576 rather 567.2 million ringgit compared with 
1.74 billion ringgit in the same period last year. Now, for the cumulative six-month period ended 30th June 2021, the group saw its net profit surge to 4.35 billion ringgit from 2.99 billion ringgit previously, while revenue slipped to 23.56 billion ringgit from 25.03 billion ringgit previously. Group President and Chief Executive Officer Dato Abdul Farid Alia said given the expectation for a more challenging second half, the group would continue its strategy of focusing on robust risk management. He added that the group would also focus on strengthening its capital and growing its current and savings accounts deposit base to provide sufficient buffers for unexpected events. Coming up, Customs foil attempt to smuggle out drugs worth 6.6 .6 million ringgit at KLIA. Forty-seven landslides were detected at several locations on the slopes and peak of Gunung Jirai by the Department of Mineral and Geoscience or JMG Geological Disaster Task Force after the mudflow phenomenon at the mountain last week. Kada Perlis and Pulau Pinang JMG Director Abdullah Sulaiman said the landslides of various magnitudes were found from mapping using unmanned aerial vehicle, which is UAV, or drone in the targeted areas apart from monitoring by the team at the identified locations. Now, commenting further, Abdullah said, as yesterday, JMG's task force has identified 47 landslips in Gunung Jirai with 25 occurring at Titi Hayun, 10 in Batu Hampar, and another 10 were found on the route to the mountain peak, while two more were discovered in Tanjong Jaga and Lembah Bujang. Well, he said a large portion of the incidents or landslide locations were found in Titi Hayun and Batu Hampar in Yan district. He also said most of the landslides found were major with sizes of between 10 to 50 meters wide apart from minor slips of between 2 to 5 meters detected. Elaborating further, he said the latest finding is very important for the team to understand and get the actual picture on the mountain and to draw comprehensive conclusions on the geological disaster. In the floods following the mud flow phenomenon, in the evening of 18th August, six people lost their lives and about 800 houses were affected in Yan district, with 200 more in Murbok in Kuala Muda district. Well, three men and a woman were charged at the Kulai Magistrates Court in Johor today for killing a 46-year-old man in a fight at a house in Taman Tan Yok Fung last week. And Mohamed Hafizi, Mohamed Kasim, 36, Awaluddin Abdul Hamid, 54, Tan Wei Chong, 25, and Nur Hazida Hassan, 32, all unemployed, nodded in understanding when the charge was read out to them before Magistrate Sharifa Maliha Said Hussein. However, no plea was recorded from the four accused as the case comes under the jurisdiction of the High Court. They were charged with the murder of Nosai Sain Mohamed in a house at G. Tigapulo, Jalan Tan Yok Fong, Doblo Lima, in Taman Tan Yok Fong, between 7 a.m. and 9.45 p.m. last 16 August. The charge frame under Section 302 of the Penal Code and read together with Section 34 of the same law provides the mandatory death sentence upon conviction. The court then set 5th October for re mention pending the post mortem report. Deputy Public Prosecutor Edelyn Wong appeared for the prosecution while the accused were not represented. A 34-year-old police, Lance Corporal, pleaded not guilty at the Seremban Sessions Court today to two corruption charges totaling 2,000 ringgit. Kamarul Zaman Mohamed Sanusi, who is now working at the state police contingent in Seremban, claimed trial to the charges before Judge Madiha Harola. Now, for the first charge, he was accused of a sec accepting 1,000 ringgit from Mohamed Faisal Abdul Hamid to help settle a case involving one Mohamed Rafiq Abdul Hamid while working at the Sepang police station in Slango. The offence was allegedly committed at 10 p.m. at a house in Taman College Heights on 16 January 2019. And for the second charge, the accused allegedly agreed to accept another 1,000 ringgit from the same individual at around 10 p.m. outside a shop in Snawang two days later. Kamarul Zaman was charged under sections 16 subsection A, subsection B and 17 subsection A of the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission Act 2009 
punishable under Section 24, Subsection 1 of the same legislation. Offenders can be jailed up to 20 years or fined five times the amount of the bribe involved upon conviction. The court allowed the accused, who was unrepresented, to be released on 7,000 ringgit bail with one surety and ordered him to report at the state MACC office on the first week of every month. Judge Madiha also fixed 29 September for case management. The Royal Malaysian Customs Department, JKDM, has foiled an attempt to smuggle 184 kilograms of drugs worth some 6.6 .6 million ringgit out of the country through the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA. Well, Customs Director General Dato Sri Abdul Latif Abdul Qadir said the drugs were found stashed inside equipment declared as electric contact grill uh, during an inspection on 16 August and four suspects were also detained to assist in its probe. Hasil pemeriksaan mendapati 10 daripada 14 kotak tersebut mengandungi 184 bungkusan teh yang mengandungi bahan kristal jenis yang disyaki sebagai dadah berbahaya jenis metamfetamin. Jumlah berat kasar keseluruhan bahan disyaki dadah tersebut adalah seberat 184 kilogram dengan anggaran nilai sebanyak 6.624 juta ringgit Malaysia. Judge Sri Abdul Latif said based on preliminary probes, this was the 11th time the members of the syndicate had sent such cargo through KLIA. Well, he said two suspects aged 35 and 43 years old were detained with the drugs at the airport. Two more aged 42 and 45 years old were detained in follow-up raids in Nila in Negeri Sambilan. Judge Sri Abdul Latif said the syndicate tried to deceive customs officers by declaring the goods as electrical equipment, which came under the general cargo category. The suspects are in remand until 30th August and the case is being investigated under Section 39B, Subsection 1, Subsection A of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952. Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC Chairman Dr. Fadlullah Suhaimi Abdul Malik, has never issued any emails regarding procurement and payment matters to international vendors. MCMC, in a statement today, said there were certain individuals detected using the name of its chairman through suspicious email addresses which, among others, contained instructions to the Commission's Finance and Accounts Department head regarding the matter. Elaborating further, MCMC said their investigation, however, revealed that the email was never issued by the MCMC chairman and emphasized that the official email address for MCMC staff ended with the domain name mcmc.gov.my and not other domain names. The statement also said, at the same time, any official business will be done transparently and not through emails. Therefore, MCMC reminded the public to be wary of the existence of suspicious emails using the names of organization leaders, as it is most likely a scam tactic by irresponsible parties. It also advised the public to contact the authorities for further verification if unsure about the authenticity of the content of such emails. Coming up in sports, national track cyclists fall flat in Tokyo Paralympics. Well, the National Track Cycling Squad riders did not stand out on their first day of competition at the Tokyo Paralympic Games today. Nur Azlia Shafinas Mohamed Zais with her helmsman Nurul Shuhada Zanal, who started the national squad campaign at the Izu Velodrome this morning, finished in ninth place in the women's 1,000 meter time trial in the B, that's for visual impairment category, with a time of 1 minute 15.005 seconds. Dutch rider Larissa Klassen not only won gold, but also broke the Paralympic Games record with a time of 1 minute 05.219 seconds 
leaving Great Britain rider Eileen Meglin Obe to settle for silver after clocking 1 minute 06.743 seconds, while Great Hoyt of Belgium posted 1 minute 07.943 seconds to take home the bronze. In the men's 3,000 meter pursuit C1 for physical disabilities category, Mohamed Yusuf Hafizi Shaharuddin had to forget his desire to at least compete in the bronze medal race after finishing seventh out of ten riders in the qualifying race with a time of three minutes 58.413 seconds. Russian Paralympic Committee rider Mikhail Asashov, who emerged as the fastest rider in the race, also broke the world record with a time of three minutes 35.954 seconds. Well, that concludes this evening's news at 10. Now, top sorry, Prime Minister to unveil new cabinet tomorrow morning. Ministers to be sworn in Monday. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm Mohammed Amin Carlos and stay tuned to Saloran Brita RTM and have a pleasant evening.